my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is for you. I hope you are having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Today is Monday, March 26th. Oh man, it is. What time is it? It is 8.26 a.m. in the morning. I have a, a show. I'm working today at 11, doing a gig all day filming. Um, and I got an amazing show prepared for you guys today. I am so excited to do the podcast earlier than normal on a Monday, but man, I can't wait. I got to say, this weekend, I finally got into March Madness. Oh, man. Oh, man. I can't wait to break it down. I, I can't believe how much I love great playoff basketball. Oh, my goodness. I forgot how great playoff basketball is. I really wish I'd gotten into March Madness much sooner. But first, I have a topic about Sam Darnold I cannot wait to share. It's a little bit complicated. So we're going to go simple, back to complicated. So we're going to simple, complicated, and back to simple, right? That's going to be the rhythm of this next topic. I believe I can explain the complicated football stuff in a way that everybody can understand, no matter how much football knowledge they have. Let's talk about Sam Darnold. Do not let your fear of failure stop you from taking a chance. So many people all over the media, all over the NFL, no matter what it is, many people are concerned about Sam Darnold's turnovers. So in 27 games at USC, he had 22 interceptions and 21 fumbles. Again, do not let your fear of failure stop you from taking a chance, stop you from going for it, from pulling the trigger. Everybody has a fear of failure. I promise you. I feel it. You feel it. I saw this two times just yesterday. Two times I saw examples of people who had fear of failure and either took a chance or did not take a chance. I'm in my buddy's room last night and he's talking a girl. He, he's talking about a girl he was into last year. He said, you know, I wasn't sure if she was into me. He didn't know if she liked him back. And you know what? He never found out. Because he never took a chance. He never asked her, hey, are you into me too? He never took a chance. And yesterday, a different friend, I'm with my best friend, uh, Nathan, we're changing his spark plugs on his car. And we're screwing a spark plug out of his engine when it breaks. The porcelain part, there's, it's, a, it's a long thing. The porcelain part of it snaps off. Not all the way. The thing still works. You can, it's still attached, but it snapped. It's not good. So we had a choice. We could either leave it and, and leave the damaged spark plug in. It wouldn't run great, but it would work technically. Or we could take a risk and we could try to take that spark plug out. And the risk was, if we try to take it out, we could risk breaking it more. And then you have a spark plug stuck in the engine that you cannot get out. That was a problem. What we did, we took a chance. We got it out. We got that spark plug out of the engine. And now his, his Ranger runs better than it ever has before. His Ranger's finally running on six cylinders. It hasn't for months. I've I've not seen this. I've never seen Nathan's Ranger run as well as it did yesterday when we drove around town. So Sam Darnold takes chances, and I have no problem with it. You have to take chances in life to make it. Sam Darnold makes plays. He takes chances, but he makes plays, and he wins games. I have no problem with Sam Darnold's turnovers. None at all. You know, my dad worked in the business world for years. I guess my dad still does work in the business world. And growing up, my dad always talked about how in his company, in his world, execution was really important. The question is, are you willing to take a chance? Are you going to ask a girl to coffee? Are you going to go to college far away? Are you going to start a podcast? Are you going to try fixing your own engine? See, Sam Darnold has an aggressive play style, and I do not fault him for it. I have no problem. Sam Darnold takes risks. He does. You do. I do. And it, we all do it. And it's funny. It's like we forget that in the 27 games Sam Darnold played at USC, he went 21 and 6. And two years ago, Max Brown was a starting quarterback for the first three games at USC. They were awful. They couldn't win. They, they were splitting time with two quarterbacks. And midseason, after three games, right before the Utah game, USC suddenly committed to Sam Darnold. They said, Sam Darnold is our starting quarterback. And USC went from a garbage truck on fire to 
winning a Rose Bowl, beating Penn State in one of the best Rose Bowls I've ever seen. And it's probably not the best ever, but it was up there, man. It was a fantastic Rose Bowl. And don't forget, Sam Darnold may have played in 27 games, but he started 24. Sam Darnold only started 24 games at USC. He was 20 and 4 in games that Sam Darnold started. Now, Sam Darnold had three turnovers against Ohio State. Again, against Ohio State, he lost 24 to 7. It was his maybe his worst loss ever in college. And the turnovers against you uh, against Ohio State. The turnovers Sam Darnold had against Ohio State perfectly describe. It's like a great analogy for who Sam Darnold is and why he had so many turnovers. So, so first, let's talk about an interception that Sam Darnold threw. So USC is in a formation. There are three receivers to the left, a tight end on the right, and a running back is to Sam Darnold's left on the three receiver side. Sam Darnold fakes the run and throws a short pass right over the middle of the field directly into a safety's chest for an interception. He throws it right at the guy. On film, it looks horrendous. Like, Sam, what were you thinking? Why would you throw it there? This interception happened for three reasons. First, there was a massive coaching failure. Second, Sam Darnold made a bad read, no doubt. And third, pressure, ca- pressure throughout the game and pressure throughout Sam Darnold's entire season caused that interception to happen. Look, I ran this play in high school. I know the read. I've done it many times. It's a very simple play. The coaches on this play failed Sam Darnold. I've criticized USC many, many times for an unimaginative game plan, unimaginative play calling. Play calling that is not even close. It's simple. It's high school play calling. I think my high school coaches were better play callers than USC's coaches were. I know that sounds crazy and aggressive. My coaches were insane. They're the best coaches coaching staff in Washington, in my opinion. And I watched every snap that Sam Darnold played at USC. I mean, it's all out there. You can all watch it. This play was this. A fake run to throw a short pass over the middle. And they ran this play all season. It's called a pop pass. USC ran a pop pass. USC ran a fake run, throw over the middle, when the running back was on the same side as multiple receivers. What that means is this play was incredibly predictable. It was a coaching flaw. Every time the running back was on the same side as multiple receivers, you could expect a pop pass. It's designed. We all, everybody can see it coming. And and the goal of this play is you fake the run. You make a linebacker step towards the quarterback. And then you throw a pass behind the linebacker who stepped forward to try to stop the run. Except on this play, Ohio State blitzed. And this is where coaching failure number two comes into play. So, the linebacker trying to blitz is running straight at Sam Darnold. And a safety replaces the linebacker. Linebacker runs at Sam Darnold. Safety moves forward and steps into the vacant hole. And the safety steps right in front of the pass. Again, this is where coaching failure number two came into play. So you know who should have been wide open? In fact, you know who really would have been wide open if he'd ran a route? The far wide receiver on the far left. On the snap, the corner turns and runs. Let me know if I'm getting too complicated. What this did was leave the third wide receiver on the far left wide open. Except the guy didn't run the route. And you know why he didn't run the route? Because USC never practiced that play against the Blitz. He doesn't expect the ball. He never thought he was going to get thrown to. Even though he would have been wide open if he'd ran his route. USC never practiced that play against a different look than the one they ran all season. They never ran that route against the Blitz. Ever. Because clearly, the receiver didn't know what to do. He's never gotten the ball thrown to him. This is a massive coaching failure. Now again, it's, it's not just the coach's fault. It's also Sam Darnold. You would think Sam Darnold would see a safety step forward right into his passing lane. And again, so it's it's a failed read by Sam Darnold failed, the coaching failed, and the offensive line failed. All By this point of the game, Sam Darnold has been hit repeatedly, sacked multiple times. In fact, in this game, Sam Darnold against Ohio State was sacked eight times. He's had pressure in his face, and when there's pressure in your face, you are taught as a quarterback, get the ball out quick, and that is what Sam Darnold did. 
You're taught as a quarterback, literally from the time you are six years old. I played quarterback. This is what they say. If someone blitzes, throw the ball behind him. Replace a blitzer with a ball. Sam Darnold did his job. He just never been coached up for this situation. Sam Darnold did what he'd been coached to his whole life. If someone blitzes, throw the ball where they came from. And he lost. So Ohio State had three turnovers. Against Ohio State, Sam Darnold had three turnovers. He had an interception and two fumbles. What happened with the fumbles? Where did they come from? So USC was completely overmatched. And Sam Darnold was trying to make plays. Sam Darnold had to overcome the fact that his team was incredibly overmatched. He had to take risks, just like he did all season. If you watch USC all season, I watched Sam Darnold against Washington State. I was on the sideline. I was working for a company that some people refer to as the mothership. You know what I'm talking about. It was awesome. I got a front row seat. I was on USC's sideline. Here's what I see. Sam Darnold's receivers are not deep threats. They're not physically there. They weren't ready. And what would happen is corners would sit on routes, which means they were not afraid of a deep ball. So corners could sit and try to intercept routes all day. And despite that, despite the fact that corners were prepared for everything Sam Darnold had at them, Sam Darnold still had tremendous success. The the more concise way to put all of this is Sam Darnold was often overmatched and had to elevate his team to be successful. And 20 of the 24 times Sam Darnold started, he succeeded. This reminds me of when Andrew Luck carried the terrible Indianapolis Colts to the AFC Championship. Let's compare their seasons. In 2014, Andrew Luck had 40 touchdowns, 16 interceptions, and three fumbles. In 16 games, Andrew Luck averaged just under two turnovers a game, about 1.18 turnovers per game. And in Sam Darnold's last season at USC, 14 games, 26 touchdowns, 13 interceptions, and 13 fumbles. Just under two fumbles a game. See a correlation there? It's about the same. See, Andrew Luck and Sam Darnold are about the same guy. Both have carried average teams to a tremendous amount of wins in the Pac-12. Both play incredibly aggressive. Both Sam Darnold and Andrew Luck play incredibly aggressive. They take risks. You have to take risks in life. Go ask that girl the coffee. Go try to fix your car. Do not let fear of failure stop you from taking chances in your life. Do not. Everybody has fear of failure. I do, believe it or not. I do all the time. I'm terrified. You know what my plan is? My plan is to have my own company. I want to do a sports podcast. I don't want to work for Fox. I don't want to work for ESPN. I want to do this. This is what I want to do. Look, I'm not concerned at all with Sam Darnold's turnovers because I don't care if someone takes risks. Sam Darnold takes a lot of risks and he usually wins. Does he have a lot of turnovers? Sure. But you know who, who leads? I, remember Brett Favre? Remember Peyton Manning? They had tremendous amounts of turnovers. I think, I think Peyton Manning's the all-time interception leader. And I believe Brett Favre is second. Uh, if Sam Darnold's anywhere near that, hallelujah. You know who doesn't take chances? Case Keenum or Alex Smith, Andy Dalton. Do you want Sam Darnold to be Andy Dalton? Or Andrew Luck. Because I would rather Sam Darnold emulate Andrew Luck than Andy Dalton every single day of my life. I have no problems with Andrew with Sam Darnold's. I have no problem with Sam Darnold's turnovers. None at all. All right. I have a great podcast for you guys today. I, I finally got into March Madness. I, I forgot how much I love playoff basketball. I wish I had gotten into it much sooner. I'm going to tell you who I believe will win the March Madness NCAA National Championship. I have a couple questions. Duke and Kansas was incredible. I'm going to talk about that. Is Loyola a real team? I have a lot of people who are very, very well-versed in basketball. I've been texting them for hours. I got their opinion, and I think it's really, really interesting. I'm going to share that with you guys. And, and some believe, even though some people think Sam Darnold is an incredible quarterback, that is a all-pro, like, caliber quarterback. He's an Andrew Luck style quarterback. He's going to be the next big thing in the NFL. Even though people have such faith in Sam Darnold, some people who have the same faith in Sam Darnold still believe he would fail in Cleveland. Why do people believe so strongly Sam Darnold might fail in Cleveland? We're talking about Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook got into a fight. We're going to talk about Tom Brady retiring. 
I have a ton to say today. I'm really excited. Can't wait to get to it. Remember, you can subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube. You can also find my best, most interesting clips on YouTube. If you want to help me grow this podcast, tell your friends about Strong Opinion Sports. Share it on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. If you understand Reddit, I have no idea. I don't understand Reddit at all. Help me grow Strong Opinion Sports by telling your friends about this show. My name is Zach Schumler. I want to move on. I'm really, really excited. Um, man, so here's what's next. Take a drink of water first. Oh, it's early. I haven't. 841. Man, <laughs> we're going to cut it close. I don't know how I'm going to get the show out by 11 o'clock. We're going we're gonna to wing it. It's going to be interesting. <clears throat> I am picking Villanova to win the college basketball NCAA national championship. And there are some obvious reasons why I'm picking Villanova. And then there's one reason that I think is incredibly important. So first, the obvious reasons. Well, of course, Villanova has four starters that are juniors. They have a sophomore and a freshman that come off the bench. They may have a lot of minutes. They have a freshman who starts. But they have three guys that were there two years ago when they won a national championship. The takeaway from this is Villanova has a ton of experience. That, that's one obvious reason. Villanova also plays fantastic defense. They have great ball movement. They can score. Look, ask West Virginia. Villanova can score all day. They have Jalen Brunson, who's fantastic. And Villanova has an all-time coach, Jay Wright. But here's the key. Yesterday, Villanova had an off game. They played badly. But they won. They had a bad game and they won. By 11 points. It wasn't close. <laughs> it wasn't close. They had a bad game. And they still beat Texas Tech by 11 points. So in any kind of tournament, the question always is, can you survive your bad game? Can you survive playing a bad game? Because eventually, everybody plays a bad game in every tournament. In fact, think about this. Every college football season is basically a long, it's a 13-14 game playoff, if you will. If you want to win a national championship, you basically can't lose. It happens sometimes. Alabama got in. But Alabama last year won the national championship in college football. And again, the whole season is basically a must-win tournament. <clears throat> they had a bad game against Mississippi State, and they won. They lost to Auburn later in the season. And, and let me tell you what, if Alabama loses to Auburn and plays bad and loses to Mississippi State, they have no chance at the national title. But Alabama was able to survive their bad game. It helped them out. So Villanova yesterday was only 4 for 24 from three-point range. That's 16%. Well, Texas Tech shot 25% three-pointers. Point, uh, three points, three pointers. And both teams, Texas Tech and Villanova, shot 33% from field goal range. Just all shots combined. Takeaway is Villanova had a bad night shooting. In fact, they had more turnovers than Texas Tech. I think by it was like 12 to 9. However, they, they had a bad game of shooting. They had more turnovers. They didn't play well on offense. They hustled. Villanova played good defense. They had more steals. They had more blocks. Villanova had 18 more rebounds and made a bunch of free throws. And they survived their bad game. Villanova survived their bad game in the NCAA tournament. See, everybody and every single kind of tournament, everybody eventually has a bad game. I'm picking Villanova to win it all. For all the obvious reasons, the coach, the players, experience, yada, yada, good defense. But also because Villanova got their bad game out of their system. Everybody has one. The question is, can you survive? Villanova survived. I am picking Villanova to win the national championship. Now, the threat to them, the biggest threat to them is Kansas. Now, if you look at Kansas, Malik Newman has tremendously elevated his play in the NCAA tournament. Malik Newman Went off yesterday against Duke. Um, the problem is, every time something like that happens, it eventually has to come to an end. You, when you're playing above your potential, when you're playing out of your league, out of your mind, eventually you come back down to earth. My guess is against Villanova, 
Malik Newman will come back down to earth. That's what my friends say. That's what I think. Everybody tells me that. I believe Malik Newman is going to come back down to earth. Villanova is going to beat Kansas and probably beat Loyola in the national championship. I am picking Villanova to win the national championship. It'll be fun. We'll see what happens. I'm not afraid to be wrong, but I'm excited to see what happens. I'm picking Villanova. Let me tell you what. Yesterday, Duke and Kansas was everything I wanted and then some. Oh, my goodness. Have I told you how much I love basketball playoffs? I, I God dang. Half-court playoff basketball. Oh, my goodness. It's fun. It's fantastic. I should have gotten into the, the tournament much sooner. I feel bad about it. In fact, yesterday, I, I'm watching Duke in Kansas, and a four-point lead felt like a huge mountain to climb up. It was just like, oh, my goodness. I'm rooting for Duke. My, my dad, you know, I, I'm parcel to Duke. You're growing up. My dad and I used to watch Duke. I, I have fond, fond memories growing up with my dad. My dad was a Duke fan. It was fun to watch. I, I enjoyed that experience with my dad. I, I like Duke because of my dad and my connection. It makes me think of growing up with my dad. And, and man, it just I'm watching Duke, and Duke is down by four points. And I'm like, man, this feels like an insurmountable lead. They, how are they going to get over this? That's the stress of playoff basketball. It's fantastic. Yesterday, Duke and Kansas, 18 lead changes. 11 ties. You have a legendary coach on one side, Coach K. You have a legend in his own right, Bill Self from Kansas. Gosh, fantastic. Duke and Kansas was everything I wanted and then some. I, I have two thoughts of controversy. Well, two, probably three, I guess. First was when Wendell Carter Jr. fouled out for blocking. Go back, watch the play. I was astounded. I was like, man, if that's not a charge, what is a charge in college basketball? I have no idea. I was just like, man, are you kidding me? How how can you contest a shot if that is not a block? He's outside. The restricted. I was just like, man, I, I don't know how. I have no idea how that's a block, not a charge. But I'll, I'll give the refs credit. Fine, fair enough. The block versus the charge call, that's the hardest call to make in all of basketball. That's a tough call. It's, it's a judgment call. It's really down to personal preference. That's a tough one. That's fine. It's not black and white like some. And then, then there was that controversial out-of-bounds call where they did a replay. They watched the replay for like 20 years. I was like, man, are we ever going to get back to this game? And, and I'm watching this, this play, and I'm like, man, this is really going to hurt Kansas. Kansas has all the momentum right now, and this replay is just going to slow them down. It's going to hurt their rhythm. And then, no, not at all. Kansas came right back and forced overtime. This incredible shot. It, it was fantastic, man. That shot to force overtime... It reminded me of the first time I realized who Mario Chalmers was. If you, if you look back, uh, when I remember watching this with my dad very vividly. I had to look up what year it was. It was 2008. But I remember watching with my dad, Mario Chalmers. Uh, Kansas was down, losing to Memphis. Down by three, Mario Chalmers hit a three to force overtime with like two seconds left. It was amazing. And then eventually, Kansas would go on to win the game in overtime. That is exactly what happened yesterday against Duke. It was like, man... This is just a rehashing of history. It's hilarious. It was interesting. It was fun. And Duke in Kansas was an amazing game. I loved it. It was fantastic. I hope you watched it. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I, that's all I, I really have to say. Here's another controversial thing I have to say, though, about Duke in Kansas. I love Grayson Allen. I, I, oh, I love Grayson Allen. I, I know that's controversial. I know most people hate Grayson Allen. You know, he's, he's been called for tripping. He's considered a dirty player. I love Grayson Allen the same way I love Draymond Green. Grayson Allen is tough. He's chippy. He's a little dirty. Grayson Allen is a guy I want on my team. He's a guy I want to play with. He's not a guy I would want to play against. Yeah, he would make me so angry. And I want to point out, 10 minutes left in the first quarter. Grayson Allen tipped a pass going out of bounds. And the refs missed it. The refs didn't see it. The refs called Duke basketball, even though it was clearly out on Grayson Allen. And Grayson Allen played it off. He's like, nah, I didn't touch it. What are you talking about? And Duke got the basketball back. And I, I got text. Did you see that? That's why I hate Grayson Allen. Grayson Allen is a dirty player. Are you kidding me? I love that. Oh, I love that. Th that's what I would do. And pick up basketball. I didn't touch that ball. Growing up, high school basketball. I didn't touch that ball. I, I remember plays like that. Of course you try to. You do everything you can to win. Is it dishonest? Oh, yeah, it's dishonest. Do I care? No. I love it. I love that. You do everything you can to win. I want a guy like Grayson Allen on my team. He's chippy. 
He's physical. He's tough. He's a leader. I don't really think he's an NBA guy, but man, uh, Grayson Allen's career at Duke has ended. And uh, I, I just, farewell, man. Grayson Allen, all this controversy. A lot of people hate him. I think it's fun. I like villains. And uh, Grayson Allen, what a career at Duke. And uh, great job. So let's talk about Loyola. <laughs> Loyola is an 11 seed. And I want to point out the reason that most people doubt Loyola in the, Nash, in, in the playoff bracket. The reason most people doubt Loyola is simply because they are an 11 seed. Because of a label that was given to them, we doubt Loyola. Preconceived notion. Nobody believes an 11 seed could ever win a national championship. If you doubt Loyola, don't just scream at me, 11 seed, 11 seed, 11 seed. Give me a real reason that has to do with on the basketball court. That's fine. If you make a valid point about basketball, I'll listen to you. Fine. Make a point about Loyola on the court. Then, hey, if you have a valid reason, I'll understand why Loyola has no chance to win a national championship. But, but if you just scream 11 seed, I'm not going to listen to you. A bunch of my buddies play for the Washington State Gray Squad basketball team. What that is, is it's a group of dudes who practice against the Division I Washington State's women's basketball team. These guys, these guys can dunk. I play football with them. They're crazy good at basketball. They are unbelievable. They really know basketball. Some of them play JUCO. They play in college. I mean, these guys know basketball really well. I'm texting them. I'm asking, hey, what do you think of Loyola? These guys tell me Loyola matches up really well with Michigan. Loyola is unselfish. Loyola has great ball movement. And even though Michigan plays great defense, Michigan could be in trouble. Michigan and Loyola play uh, in, in the final four and Loyola matches up really well with Michigan. Their offensive scheme and Michigan's defense, even though Michigan's playing great defense, Michigan could be in trouble. Loyola has a lot of guys. Everybody can score. Everybody on that Loyola team can score. They start two seniors, two juniors, and a freshman. And off the bench, they have a freshman and a senior. Again, what that means is Loyola is incredibly experienced. I think, I believe in this tournament, experience is incredibly valuable. Villanova, is, everybody left is experienced. But don't discount, Villanova, don't discount Loyola simply because they are an 11 seed. My friends say, Michigan-Loyola, that will be a great basketball game. Loyola has a real shot. Everybody on Loyola's team can shoot. They're top 20 in the nation in shooting threes. They're top 20 in the nation in assists. Again, if you doubt Loyola, fine. I have no problem with that. But give me a reason that has to do with basketball why you doubt them. Don't just scream, 11 seed, 11 seed, 11 seed. I don't care. Do you remember when Russell Wilson came to the NFL? Everybody labeled Russell Wilson a short quarterback. Did you watch Russell Wilson play football? If you watch the guy play football, he's clearly like a top 10 pick. And yet he went in the third round because everybody put a label on him and didn't believe in him. Don't put labels on people. Don't put labels on Loyola. Don't put labels on Baker Mayfield, on Russell Wilson. If you don't like them, talk about their play. Don't talk about some label you put on them. So my bet is Villanova is going to beat Loyola in the national championship. I, I, of course, after the Final Four. But I think Loyola has every shot to beat Michigan. And I think eventually they're going to make the national championship and lose to Loyola, to lose to Villanova. But I guess we shall see. But I, I think I believe Loyola is better than people realize. And if you're going to doubt them, just give me a reason that has to do with basketball on the court. That's all I ask. All I ask, do not scream 11 seed. Because that's just a label someone gave them. I don't care. I, I don't care about that. All right, I'm going to take a short break when I return. Why does everybody doubt Sam Darnold will not succeed in Cleveland? I'm going to compare Sam Darnold to a one-legged stool. We're talking about uh, Russell Westbrook got in a huge fight yesterday. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Tom Brady retiring. When will Tom Brady retire? We're going to talk about Baker Mayfield. Who does Baker Mayfield actually translate to in the NFL? There's a lot of Russell Wilson comparisons. There's a lot of... Johnny Manziel comparisons. There's a lot of Drew Brees comparisons. Who, in fact, even Case Keenum. Who does Baker Mayfield translate to in the NFL? 
We're going to talk about Dominic and Sue. Remember, you can subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube, as well as my best, most interesting clips. Tell your friends about Strong Opinion Sports. If you want to help me grow this podcast, tell your friends about Strong Opinion Sports on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Reddit, if you understand Reddit. Do me a solid. Help me grow the audience by telling your friends face-to-face, whatever it is. Hey, there's a podcast. I really like it. His name is Alex Shelmer. He's crazy. He's goofy. He's young. But I like him. He makes me think. He makes me very angry. Whatever it is. Whatever you listen to the show. Tell your friends about it. Help me grow. My name is Alex Shomler. I will be right back. All right. I am recovering from a sinus infection, but I do feel better than I have in weeks. I can talk. I can breathe. It feels fantastic. I'm still not 100%, but I'm about 95% there. Yeah, boy, Zach is back. Oh, I feel great. Let's compare Sam Darnold and a one-legged stool. <laughs> You're like, what in the world? How how can we do that? Uh, so the, think, think about this. The Giants, the Eagles, the Patriots, the Seahawks, even the Broncos when the Broncos had Peyton Manning. What do they all have in common? Well, all of those teams won a Super Bowl. The Giants won a Super Bowl, the Eagles, the Patriots, Seahawks, Broncos. But why? Why did those organizations win a Super Bowl? What does it take to win a Super Bowl? It takes three things. It takes a great owner, a great coach, and at least a stable quarterback, but hopefully a great quarterback. So a quarterback, coach, and owner, Robert Kraft, Tom Brady, Bill Belichick. Whoever the Seahawks owner is, Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson. Good owner, good coach, good quarterback. Some people who believe Sam Darnold is a home run at quarterback, they believe Sam Darnold is an absolute Pro Bowl fantastic quarterback in the NFL. They think he's a star in the NFL. However, they believe Sam Darnold has no shot in Cleveland. They think he better sign a short contract and get out of Cleveland as soon as possible. So my question is, how comfortable is it to sit on a one-legged stool? It's not. It's terrible. You can't sit on a one-legged stool. It doesn't work. Stools normally have three legs. You need three parts to win a Super Bowl. You need a coach, you need a quarterback, and you need an owner. You need all three legs of the stool to win a Super Bowl. Now, with amazing balance, if you have the most incredible balance and maybe you're Superman, you can sit on a two-legged stool. It is possible. It's freaking crazy challenging. You have to have incredible balance, but it is possible. Peyton Manning did it. Peyton Manning sat on a two-legged stool. You know, the Colts have a crazy owner. Indianapolis owner is insane. And yet with a crazy owner in Indianapolis, Peyton Manning was still able to win a Super Bowl. All it took to win a Super Bowl with a bad owner was, you know, just a Hall of Fame quarterback and just a Hall of Fame coach. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's pretty rare, isn't it? So the Browns have a terrible owner. He, he's crazy. Jerry, I forget his name right now. I, I Whatever, it doesn't matter. The Browns owner fired general manager after general manager after coach after CEO. It's absurd. Here's what happened in just a span of four years within the Browns organization. Head coach Rod Chudzinski, Chudzinski, head coach Rod Chudzinski, fired. Then they fired general manager Mike Lombardi, CEO Joe Banner, fired head coach Mike Pettin, fired head coach, fired general manager Ray Farmer, fired general manager Sashi Brown, Ray Far- Farmar. I don't know. Point is, one, two, three, four, five, six, six front office people, a couple head coaches, all fired in the span of four years. That is no stability. How do you think you can ever win with no stability like that? That's crazy. That's the mark of a terrible owner. So the Browns have a terrible owner. Some people say until the Browns are either sold or that guy dies and gives the team to his sons. Until the Browns have a new owner, some people believe the Browns can never win. Well, maybe maybe the two-legged stool will work. Maybe, maybe they can have the crazy owner and do what Peyton Manning did. That would mean Sam Darnold would have to be a Hall of Fame quarterback. And that would mean Hugh Jackson would have to be a Hall of Fame coach. I like Hugh Jackson. 
I don't know that he's Tony Dungy, okay? I like him. I think he's, I, I like him more than most. Most people hate Hugh Jackson. I don't. I think he's actually a competent coach. But uh, Hall of Fame coach, that's a little early. And Sam Darnold, quite, not quite a Hall of Famer yet. So I, I think there's some validity to it. Sam Darnold may be screwed. He doesn't have a great coach. He has a terrible owner. No matter how good Sam Darnold is, it's possible he may not be able to overcome it. But now here's my optimism for you guys, for you Browns fans, because I'm a guy out there. I am rooting for the Browns. The Browns have not been good my entire life, and I want so badly. I'm biased as all get out. I so badly want to see the Cleveland Browns succeed. If anybody can turn around the Cleveland Browns, it is Sam Darnold. I've met Sam Darnold. I've worked out with Sam Darnold. That dude is a different dude on another level. I saw him. I was on the sidelines of USC this season. Sam Darnold is a different quarterback. He's by far the best quarterback in this draft. I love Baker Mayfield, but he's better. Sam Darnold's better than Baker Mayfield, I mean. Sam Darnold is special. He, he's, he's really an Andrew Luck style guy. He, if anybody, if any quarterback in the entire world can fix the Cleveland Browns, it's Sam Darnold. It is Sam Darnold. So for those of you who believe, hey, there's no, no hope in, in Cleveland, no matter how good Sam Darnold is, there's no hope. Let me tell you what. Again, if anybody can turn around the Cleveland Browns, it is Sam Darnold. I so badly want to see the Browns succeed. I oh, so badly do. Yesterday, Russell Westbrook got into a fight. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. I loved it. A lot of people hated it. People gave him crap. In the third quarter against the Portland Trailblazers, there was a bit of a skirmish. Loved it. I absolutely loved it. Russell Westbrook is defending his guys. Look at it. Watch, watch the film. I don't, I'm not going to play the video. I, I got to get this video out by 11. Watch the video, though. Go watch it on YouTube. Russell Westbrook stands up for his teammates. It's fantastic. I remember before my senior year of football. We're at the Oregon State football camp. We're scrimmaging against Eastside Catholic. And a defensive end who had an offer to UCLA was face masking the hell out of my running back. He was just mauling my running back. And that made me angry. And mind you, this running back and I were still, I don't know the best way to put it. He, he messaged me the other day. Great guy. We get along great now. He, he, we were still building chemistry is a good way to put it. I, the quarterback, ran up to the UCLA defensive end and pushed him to the ground. Get off my guy. You don't do that to my guy. Felt great about myself. Oh, yeah. I got my dudes back and tell the guy, you know, obviously the guy stood over me. Now I'm looking up at this big, like, 6'6 dude. I'm like, my bad. I'm so sorry. And a brawl started. We, we got into an all-out brawl against Eastside Catholic. And I'm really proud of that moment. I'm really proud of standing up for my teammates. You know what happened when we graduated? We're, we're all hanging out. Uh, it's, it's after graduation night. We're around a campfire at our middle linebacker's house. And that, that moment gets brought up. And some guys were telling me, you know, that moment showed us. You're not just some princess quarterback. You had our back. You had our back. We had your back. It set the tone for the entire season. That's not my goal. I was just, I was just angry. I wasn't mature enough to know the gravity of what I was doing. But Russell Westbrook did the same thing. Russell Westbrook stood up for his teammates. Russell Westbrook set the tone. I, I, I don't mean to talk myself up. That was not the goal of this. The goal of it was to show it means a lot to your teammates when you stand up for them. It means a lot to Paul. Paul George is watching. Everybody's watching. And, and for those of you criticizing Russell Westbrook for getting into a skirmish, it's ridiculous. I absolutely love. I love that Russell Westbrook's willing to get into a fight to defend his teammates. That's fantastic. And then there's some dumb people who, because, you know, Russell Westbrook fouled out. And with about three seconds left, the Thunder needed a three-pointer to tie the game up and force overtime. And because Russell Westbrook fouled out of the game, he wasn't there to take that shot. I mean, not to, he probably would have missed a three-pointer anyways. He's not a great legendary three-point shooter. But to those of you who say that Russell Westbrook cost his team the game by getting involved in a fight, you clearly don't understand how basketball works. Because Russell Westbrook was given a technical foul and a technical foul does not count against your personal fouls. You need five personal fouls to foul out. 
Russell Westbrook had five personal fouls and did foul out. But that skirmish, that little fight he got into, did not affect and did not influence his personal fouls because he got a technical foul. And a technical foul, again, does not count against your personal fouls in the NBA. It had no influence. Had no influence on the fact that Russell Westbrook was not there for the last play of the game. So don't tell me Russell Westbrook cost his team the game by defending his teammates. It's fundamentally not true. You don't understand basketball if that's what you were saying. I got that comment on Twitter. I was like, are you, are you freaking kidding me? You just don't know. You're, not, you're uneducated. You don't know basketball. I love Russell Westbrook defending his players. I'm not a huge Russell Westbrook fan, but I got to give the guy credit. That's a cool moment I respect that I love. Russell Westbrook defending his teammates. Yes. Nothing better. Because years later, in a couple weeks, that's going to mean a lot. Oh, Russell, Russ has our back. That's the, tone, that's the tone that that sets. That's fantastic. I love Russell Westbrook defending his guys. So there's a narrative out there that is, when will Tom Brady retire? Everybody's asking. Everybody's curious. The question is for me, what comes sooner? What will come Sooner, will Brady's body deteriorate or will his, will his desire to play go away? What's going to happen sooner, his body or his desire? Let me tell you a story. When I left football, I left college football. The reason I left was, I mean, I had a lot of family stuff going on. My parents going through a divorce and brother died. Um, but I knew when I didn't want to go to practice, I was done. Because growing up, I always loved practice. I was the one weird kid who was like, oh, I just want to I just want to play scout team quarterback. I loved it. I loved every single second of it. I loved the rain. I loved the mud. I loved football practice. Most people didn't. Most people liked basketball practice or baseball practice. I loved football practice. Football practice was my favorite thing in the entire world. And in college, when I dreaded going to practice because I was worried about an essay or I wanted to go do something creative like write or make videos... I knew uh, I should probably be done with football. That's what's going to happen to Tom Brady. As soon as Tom Brady doesn't want to do it anymore, that's when he'll stop. Un unless, of course, it's four years from now and his body fails. So the question is, what's going to come first? Is, is Tom Brady's body going to fail? Or is he going to lack the desire to play football? I think his body has two or three years left. I really do. I, I mean, he's... He's 40 years old. He won the MVP. His body's fine. And you think Tom Brady's going to get worn out and tired of football? Do you? Do you really? The guy who was a sixth round pick, who has overcome everything, who commits his entire life? I mean, maybe that does burn him out. Maybe he wants his family. We saw in the Tom versus Time documentary, Tom Brady loves his family. And there were some hints that maybe he feels unappreciated. But Tom Brady loves football. Let me tell you what, I will be, I said this before, I'll say it again. I will be the last person on the sail, on, on the sinking ship that is Tom Brady. I, I'll, the, the ship will be halfway underwater and I'll say, Tom Brady's still not retired. Tom Brady's going to announce his retirement and I'll say, oh, just watch. Maybe he won't because I'm not going to doubt Tom Brady ever again. I, I'm never going to doubt Tom Brady's desire or want to play football. No, hell no. Again, two things in my lifetime have absolutely defied all logic. LeBron James, in his 13th season, still playing fantastic basketball, going to possibly eight straight NBA finals, that defies all logic. That shouldn't happen in the NBA. And the other thing in my lifetime that has defied all logic, to me, has been Tom Brady winning the NFL MVP at 40 years old. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't be possible. And yet it did. Yet it did happen. So, I will be the last person who ever doubts Tom Brady. I will not, until the, the guy has signed the papers and is clearly gone from football, I'm not, I'm not going to believe he's retiring. I really won't. I will be the last guy to jump ship on Tom Brady's career. So, I'm going to drink some water. The, ne the next one's fantastic. I'm on a roll now. Oh my goodness, man. I, what time is it? Oh, it's 9.13. We got we to gotta speed this baby up. <clears throat> so, the Jets traded up to the number three overall pick. There's a rumor out there the Jets want Josh 
Allen, which means Baker Mayfield may slide in the NFL draft. So with the number 11 overall pick, the Dolphins could pick Baker Mayfield. Or the Bills, who have the 12th overall pick, could trade up even farther, maybe with the Colts or the Broncos or the 49ers. They could move up even farther to go and get Baker Mayfield. You realize what Baker Mayfield is, right? You realize what Baker Mayfield is. You realize the prototype for Baker Mayfield. Everybody's saying, Baker Mayfield is Russell Wilson. Baker Mayfield is Case Keenum or Johnny Manziel or Drew Brees. (laughs) You guys don't know NFL history, man. Baker Mayfield is Doug Flutie with a fair chance. Think about it. Do you know who Doug Flutie is? 5'8", undersized quarterback, won a Heisman at Boston College. Let's look at the resume. Let's look at the comparison between Doug Flutie and Baker Mayfield. Doug Flutie won a Heisman. Doug Flutie, undersized. Doug Flutie doubted because he was undersized. Both Baker Mayfield and Doug Flutie made it happen. What's happening to Baker Mayfield right now? Why isn't Baker Mayfield considered the number one overall pick? Because he's small. Because Baker Mayfield is small. Look at his tape. I love Sam Darnold. I think Sam Darnold's the best quarterback in this draft. But I'll be the first one to tell you, Baker Mayfield's tape is smoother. Baker Mayfield's tape is better. Like, point blank, that's the truth. And Doug Flutie played in a different era. Back in the day when there was some prejudice. And worse, there's still quarterback prejudice against short quarterbacks. But at least we've seen Drew Brees and Russell Wilson make it. We've seen short quarterbacks that have had some success in the NFL. Doug Flutie had to play in the, I think the USFL, then the CFL. I mean, Doug Flutie didn't get, wasn't given a chance. And Doug Flutie always, always was treated unfairly because of his size. He never got a real shot in the NFL. In fact, back in the day, Doug Flutie with the Buffalo Bills. That's, that's where this whole thing started. The Buffalo Bills might get Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield's a reincarnation of Doug Flutie. I swear to goodness. I swear to God. So back in the day, Doug Flutie led the Buffalo Bills to the playoffs. Just to get, So he led his team all the way to the playoffs. And in the first round of the playoffs, Doug Flutie got benched for a taller, more traditional-looking quarterback. (laughs) What? And mind you, this game was the Music City Miracle, where the Titans are running down the field, they throw the ball back across on a kick return, that miracle lateral for a touchdown. And the Bills tried to put Doug Flutie in and make a comeback, but it was too late. Doug Flutie never got a fair chance in Buffalo. And I really hope, man, I really hope if Baker Mayfield goes to the Bills, they give him a fair chance. Because he, he's just like, I mean, Doug Flutie and Baker Mayfield are the same guy. It, it's hilarious to me that the, the I, I challenge you to watch Doug Flutie a football life. This, this whole, this, everything I'm saying is all well chronicled in Doug Flutie a football life. It's fantastic. Baker Mayfield is Doug Flutie all over again. What's the knock on Baker Mayfield? He's small. Not Baker Mayfield's ability to read defense. Nobody's saying Baker Mayfield can't read defenses. Nobody's saying Baker Mayfield can't win games. Now, there's a legitimate concern with his arm strength. Baker Mayfield doesn't have the same arm strength as Josh Allen, but he certainly has an NFL caliber arm. I'm just proud I finally figured out what Baker Mayfield is. Baker Mayfield is not Russell Wilson or Drew Brees, Johnny Menzel, Case Keenum. Baker Mayfield is Doug Flutie round two, except this time in Buffalo. Baker Mayfield may actually get a fair chance. I'm rooting for Baker Mayfield. I believe in him. I think, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about Baker Mayfield in cold weather. However, his hands are big enough. He certainly has a strong enough arm for the NFL. Man, it would be fun. I, I, no doubt, if nothing else, it would be quite fun to watch Baker Mayfield play in Buffalo. I, I would love that. I think it'd be fun. Let's talk about Indomitian and Sue. So the Jets pulled their name from the Indomit and Sue sweepstakes. I guess the Jets gave Indomit and Sue his most lucrative contract. Whoa. Okay, well, uh, the Jets were never in the running for Indomit and Sue. Like, never, ever, ever. It's always been the Rams, the Saints, or the Titans. <laughs> like, pfft. okay. I mean, at the very least, all the Jets were was a chance for Indomit and Sue to use them as leverage. In fact, that's, that's why I think Indomit and Sue is taking so long. I think... Ndamukong and Sue is going to go to the Rams. And Ndamukong and Sue wants to play with Pro Bowl defensive tackle Aaron Donald. But he's leaving the Saints and the Titans in the conversation because 
And Dominic Nsu likes his money. He wants as much money as possible. Who knows? Maybe by the time this is out, and Dominic Nsu already signed with the Rams, but I, I'm telling you guys, I am, I, I'm pretty certain and Dominic Nsu is going to the LA Rams. He wants a Super Bowl. They want him. They're spending all the money they have right now to go after everything they can. Because I think Ndamukong Tsu wants to go to the Rams and have a chance to win a Super Bowl. <clears throat> we all know a guy like this. Do you guys remember that guy in high school who did one great thing? He scored a touchdown, had a big shot. There's a guy like this. We played against him growing up. Our rival, Columbia River, beat us on national television. We were on not top 10. Look up River Skyview, not top 10. We are not top 10. And come on, man, and world's worst. For That's why I hate, oh, what's that guy's name? Whatever, doesn't matter. That kid who had the touchdown, we, we, we kicked a field goal. They blocked it. We ran on the field. All Everybody was celebrating. This guy ran on the field, remembered, oh my gosh, the ball's live, picked up and ran for a touchdown. So the ball, like 10 seconds went by, the ball's just sitting there. People stopped filming even. This guy, Reese Keller, goes to the... I shouldn't say his name, but I'm going to. Picks up the ball, runs to the end zone. And, and still to this day, the guy has the ball. He carries it around. Look what I did in high school. Okay, you're, you're a loser, man. I'm sorry, but that was high school. It's over. Move on. And UCF football, University of Central Florida football, is in very, very dangerous waters. Central Florida football is in danger of becoming that guy. That guy who did one great thing all of high school and still to this day, like five years later, still totes. Remember that one thing I did a long time ago? <laughs> okay. I follow Central Florida's quarterback, Mackenzie Milton on Instagram. I love him. He seems like a great guy. He posted on Instagram, are you not entertained? And he's posting all these pictures of him working out and all this stuff. Not even working out. Of him like celebrating and stuff. And there's a concerning amount of irreverence from the University of Central Florida football program on Twitter, on social media, everywhere. I don't see these guys with their heads down grinding. You remember last year, Central Florida was maybe the eighth best team in the entire nation. Who, who was, you know, so we talk about who had a, a bad game. You know, Miss, Alabama's bad game was Mississippi State and Auburn. Who was... Central Florida's bad game. Was it <laughs> South Florida? I mean, who, who was? Central Florida played nobody. UCF didn't play anybody all year. Oh, they played Memphis. My bad. Psh. I don't know, man. Central Florida has talked so much smack about how they were the national championships. Mocking Alabama when they win the national championship. Taking shots. Supporting UMBC when UMBC knocked off Virginia. A 16th seed over a one in March Madness. All this gusto, all this bravado from University of Central Florida, and I'm not impressed. Let's run like 100 scenarios. Put 100 scenarios where Central Florida is put into the college football playoff. They win maybe one of them. Yeah, one time out of 100, Central Florida wins a national championship. I like Central Florida. They were a good story last year. Keywords, last year. It's over. Move on. Your coach is gone. Your seniors from last year, they're gone. Put your head down and do it again. I want to see Central Florida do it again. Hey, then I'll shut up. Then they're right. I'm, I'm the a-hole. But I'm going to follow Central Florida very closely next season because they're getting really talkative. They're getting really cocky. And if they don't back it up, I'm going to call them out. Remember all that all that bravado? Remember all that cockiness? Oh, well, you didn't back it up th this year. What what Central Florida did last year was baller, man. It was awesome. They went undefeated. They beat Auburn, an SEC team. The team that ironically beat Alabama. Like, that's awesome. That's, that's hilarious. But that was last year, okay? Move on. Get over it. You want my respect this year? Earn it. Don't talk. Do it. Gain my respect on the field. I, I'm just, I like Central Florida. They're a good story, but they were a good story last year when they had Scott Frost and a bunch of seniors. They're a new team. They have no room to be cocky. I want to see Central Florida prove it again. If they do it again, I'll, I'll be quiet. Then again, I'm, then I'm the one who's wrong. Then I'm the hypocrite. But right now, 
Central Florida is in no place to talk a bunch of smack. Not at all. All right, the last thing I have to say, it's it's kind of weird and dumb. I was really uncomfortable watching it. After Duke and Kansas ended yesterday, CBS put on a thing called Whacked Out Sports, and it was pff, oh, it was whacked out, all right? It felt like the beginning of an adult video mixed with Tosh.0. It was just weird and uncomfortable. It was girls in bikinis, and journalists were getting run over by bulls. I was like, what in the world is this show? YouTube, and if you want Whacked Out Sports, YouTube Whacked Out Sports, if you want to feel incredibly uncomfortable. It was one of the most uncomfortable things I've seen in my entire life. I, I have more to say. I just, you know, I got to get this out by 11. It's now 924. I'm going to move everything I have left from the show back to Wednesday. I have to go work a, a film gig in less than two hours, work all day till nine o'clock tonight. I have more to share on Wednesday. Can't wait to get there. Until next time, you can subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube, as well as my best most interesting clips on YouTube. Tell your friends about Strong Opinion Sports. And if you want to help me grow this podcast, share with your friends on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, whatever it is. Tell your friends about it face-to-face. Hey, there's this goofy guy on YouTube. I hate him. He's annoying. He's always wrong. He makes me want to argue with him. Hey, but he's, he's interesting, so I, I listen to him. Whatever your reason is, tell your friends about Strong Opinion Sports and help me grow. My name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so much for listening. God, I really hope the Sam Darnold... I mean, that was long. I felt That felt like 15 minutes. I don't know if that was too long. I have no idea if the Sam Darnold rant talk about turnovers. If that was too long or too convoluted, please tell me. I don't know. I, I was very proud of it. It was like, it was like six pages of notes. I mean, and I don't, I don't write everything I say word for word. I just put out like chicken scratch that kind of outlines everything. I, I hope Sam Darnold, I hope that was interesting. I really do. My name is Alex Schaumler. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back on Wednesday. My name is Alex Schaumler. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. But I'm bum. Bam, we're done.